right, still having one small issue with the overlays before we get on into the game itself. Sorry about the delay, guys. Just kind of playing it on the fly here, but uh, that should work for now. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a Beyond the Summit presentation. We're going to be bringing you guys a game between the We Play Dota 2 Cup series here. It's going to be myself, Ablaze, casting alongside Blitz. This is going to be an interesting best of three series here between Mouse Sports and uh, Four Friends plus Krilly. So again, best of three series to start off in this group stage matchup here. This is Phase 2 of We Play, brought to you by Logitech G Series, Western Digital, and Inno3D. Sorry about the technical delays, but uh, we should be good to go for the moment. And uh, yeah, the draft is already starting off pretty interesting. So again, I'm myself and Blaze, and we also have Blitz Dota here. How's, how's it going, man? Hey, it's going pretty well. Just excited to see my friends at 4FC play against Mouse. Very good team. Yep, should be an interesting matchup here. And of course, the draft has been going for a little bit. So we have uh, quite an interesting set of heroes selected already. We see Band out, the Phantom Lancer and IO taken off the board by Mouse Sports in return. 4FC taking out the Bat Rider and the Nyx Assassin. Uh, but Mouse Sports picks up for themselves a very, very team fight pot high potential lineup with Magnus, Nature's Prophet, and Lifesteal. Got to watch out for those Nakes bombs, especially with the Infest inside and, and Prophet's teleport. Along with that, Keeper Light and Lone Druid have been drafted up for for FC, so they're going to be going for very stable lanes with the Lone Druid potentially in the off lane and then the Ez lore down on the bottom lane there. Yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised that uh, Shadow Demon hasn't been picked up yet for 4FC. I think he's the best support left in the game. And also it counters Nakes pretty well, or Life Stealer, and there you go. Because the Purge goes through the Rage, and on top of that, whoever you open wounds, you can just uh, disrupt. Also, if uh, the Shadow Demon plays really well, the Poison cancels the Blink from Magnus. You can also use the Disrupt on a teammate who gets RP'd. So all around, I feel like Shadow Demon right now is probably the top tier support. I'm actually kind of surprised that uh, Keeper of the Light was picked before him. But he does, Keeper of the Light does do a really good job at um, keeping the game length going, and he's one of those heroes that will just extend the game for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely pretty much what you're looking at there. If you can kite around this life stuff, if you can't really stay on target, you're going to be extremely reliant on Magnus finding those reverse polarities. The reverse polarity, there's, there's not too much you can do about that other than pos how position it. Uh, once you get struck by it, the life stealer will be able to just nom on you there. But uh, th in this situation, yeah, if you can slow him down, you can entangle him up, just get the Orb of Venom slow alone, uh, and use the Demonic Purge. All those are great mechanics, despite... Uh, life Stealer being raged on up, so that's going to be a limiting factor, and I, I think Life Stealer is going to be spending a lot of this time trying to get to a target rather than being right on top of them. He's going to need the setup of his supports, so we already see the Prophet. He has the Sprout, technically, and the Magnus with the RP. I'm curious if they're going to go for more Disable-oriented support heroes uh, to follow on through with these 4th and 5th picks. Yeah, they absolutely need to. If you look at uh, 4 FC's bands, actually, they exclusively targeted uh, support heroes. I think Rubik, Keeper of the Light, and Shadow Demon are the three best um, supports right now in Dota, unless you have a Wisp player. Then he's also a tier one. And then after that, it kind of drops down. So now that Mouse Sports has to settle for heroes like Lena or Ancient Apparition or just the tier slightly below that, and that's really not what they want. I mean, if they could have gotten a hero like Rubik here, that would have been really, really solid. But um, So Mouse Sports likes to favor a lineup where they can team fight without the use of black who uh, manages to farm. I don't actually think he's here with them, so maybe their um, maybe their lineup set has kind of changed mm -hmm. up a little bit. So yeah, they pick up a last track here. It's still a decent support, but it does fall off a little from here's like Rubik and stuff and the like. Yeah, they're definitely going to rely on that open wounds uh, to pretty much set up the split earth over and over. Otherwise, they're going to have to rely on the Shadow Demon disrupting uh, defensively and then follow through with the Leshrex on top of that person, kind of use it as a prediction mechanism. But yeah, there are, since you mentioned it, a lot of stand-ins in, in these lineups here. Mouse Sports is running two of their core individuals. They've got Paws and they've got Koikwa, uh, two uh, individuals that can play offlane. And also Paws has recently been playing support in their core roster. But we also have Pylidae from... Uh, 
It's Kaipi Gaming, and Zizo is also from the, there as well. So those are the two support players of Kaipi. So presumably those roles, the Leshrac and this final pick, is going to be for Pilati and Zizo. But, you know, obviously Dota players in general have to be flexible, and uh, most likely they're going to be switching up the roles a little bit here and there. As uh, I mean, we got, what, three support players and an offlaner. So, something's got to give there, so we'll figure out exactly what they're going to be going on with that. But beyond that, uh, how do you feel about this Templar Assassin? Do you feel it fits in well with 4C's lineup? Um, I think it does pretty well. Uh, a lot of mobility, they have a lot of ways to protect her with that disrupt, because Templar Assassin actually after her, um, her uh, she loses the Refrain Charger, she's really, really vulnerable, so it's important that she has some sort of defensive hero to back her up, especially if Mag just decides to target her and RP her every time, but there's also the issue of Lone Druid that they have to deal with as well, so I think Templar Assassin is going to work kind of as a buffer, where she'll tank a lot of the uh, stuns and damage, and then if they do too much to deal with her, then Lone Druid has some time. And a lot of this is going to go on the Shadow Demon's positioning. If he gets RP'd, or if he gets caught out, then it's going to make life really, really difficult for 4FC. Mm -hmm. I, I gotta say, I really like this Chen pickup, though, because um, right now, first of all, they were looking at strengthening their lane, the Lifestyle Leshrac, on the top lane. It, it might need a little bit of help there, and the Chen definitely will be able to provide that if he gets an early gank-oriented creep, but Ten following that up, remaining. they have a lot of push potential, and an insane amount of push potential, to be honest. I mean, with the Five Holy Persuasion, neutral creeps, the Diabol Heating from Leshrac, then uh, Pro Nature's Prophets, Treants there, they have so much potential to just batter down on Tier 1, even possibly the Tier 2 top towers very, very early on in the game. And uh, that's going to be based around uh, a little bit about how early the Keeper Light transitions to the top lane to spam out Illuminate, and also about where Nature Prophet and his movements are going to be. Because right now, with Chen in the jungle, it kind of seems like he has to go on the off lane. And that's not exactly going to be the easiest position for him because he's up against a Shadow Demon Keeper the Light Marana. That is going to be a huge amount of potential damage and uh, stun and all that. But it looks like, uh, huh, everybody is disconnecting on out. I'm not sure if it had anything to do with the fact that they didn't get first pick originally. But um, we'll see. Uh, we'll check with the admins on that and uh, get on into the game as soon as it is actually ready to go. So we'll have information as to what's going on as soon as possible guys but otherwise uh, we'll jump on into the, this remake game and go from there presumably with the same draft but we'll have to see 10 seconds remaining the pot on pickups actually quite nice i was thinking they were actually going to take something like kunkka but maybe they want an offensive shine lane so they felt like they needed the range mm -hmm. yeah That'd be pretty interesting. I, I think it adds a lot with the disruption to arrow potential. A lot of disables there. Yeah. Um. Uh, so are, are there? Have you left the game yet? Yeah, I did actually. Okay. So um, I'm just waiting on the lobby and seeing if that'll come up soon. But yeah, these lineups are pretty interesting. I guess we'll just kind of talk a little bit of theory craft outside of that draft environment there. So who do you think has the upper hand in that scenario there? Is it going to be based around how many towers get knocked down early, or uh, is it just going to be how often the Nature's Prophet gets killed down on bottom? It's uh, going to be a combination of the two. What um, what Mal's kind of lacks is if they don't get good creeps like centaurs and the like, they're a little lacking in disable without the um, the Magnus ult. They're actually really relying on just the Magnus ult to a uh, to have like hard disables. Aside from that, you know, they're not exactly heavy in disables by any means. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really dependent on them um, to. Uh, oh, do I have to leave this? I'll leave the channel first. And then, okay. You. It's going to be dependent on um, the Chen creating space because I feel like in an all out team fight, they're too reliant on the Maggle right now. But I'd imagine um, most of this game, if they decide to offensive try lane, when you do something like that, a lot of the game is dependent on how well the offensive try lane goes because when you do that, you're anticipating winning three lanes, right? So um, the long lane for, for if 4 FC decides to offensive try lane, let's say we're going along with that. Uh, line of reasoning, then if their offensive try lane wins, TA should beat a Magnus, or at least break even, and a lone druid should actually stomp a Nature's Prophet, then they have the potential to win three lanes and then just win from there on. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the remake was based on the fact that Black is actually back here. We do have him back in the lobby, and presumably going to be picking up that Life Stealer there. So I really have a lot of confidence in how that top lane is going to work out for them. I mean, Life Stealer, Les I mean, you said the Lesh Rack kind of falls off, but early on with a good open wound setup, once that Split Hearth lands, suddenly the Chen Creeps can do whatever they want, whether they are Centaur, War Runner with the Clap, or same thing with the Hellbear. You could be looking at even just a Troll Warlord, adding a little bit of extra ensnare. One way or another, 
there is just so much potential with that tri-lane lineup and yeah it might be a little bit more difficult for that lone druid i mean of, of all heroes i think the lone druid will be able to deal with it the best uh, because he can you know peel for himself but maybe do a little bit of path block uh between himself and the life stealer but it's still going to be a little bit of a rough time and since they're kind of going for that dual core lineup if they put the lone druid on the offlane and he doesn't necessarily find the farm that he's looking for uh it won't exactly be his cup of tea in that lane situation yeah, I think actually that's why uh, 4FC will go for something like an offensive tri-lane. Because if they put three top, a hero like Keeper of the Light, Shadow Demon, and uh, Mirana top, mm -hmm. they can't actually kill Mirana. They don't have enough lockdown or burst damage to kill her without getting really lucky with Chen Creeps because she can just leap out of anything. And as long as the Shadow Demon positions himself well, anytime the Nakes open wounds, or the Life Zero, sorry, uh, open wounds the Keeper of the Light, then the Keeper of the Light just gets disrupted and then nothing hits and then they can turn it around pretty easily and here like keeper the light with blast creates too much damage i feel a lot of it's just going to come down to what creeps the chen can pick up and how successful his ganks are but i think with an offensive tri lane for fc can play pretty safely and then just rely on the uh the lone druid to kind of win his lane really hard i think actually this game is going to be determined a lot by um how the chen and the nature's prophet interact and how they move i assume there's going to be a lot of pressure top but as long as four fc can play really defensively and not give up heroes for free against just the dual lane they should be fine Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll see how that works out. I mean, it looks like my overlays on this one have to be modified slightly as well, but it'll just be like 10 seconds, guys, on the stream, and uh, then we'll be able to fully enjoy some awesome Dota from these two teams. So, get that. Shoot, I messed that up, of course. Yeah, judging by uh, Krilly's build, I think they're actually going to put um, the Panda bottom, because if you notice, he only has one set of Tangos and a Ring of Protection and an Ironwood Branch and a Stout Shield on this bear, that's a little bit greedy. Mm. Whereas um, his supports, um, what's really uh, telling is that like they have a lot of regen stacked up. The Priestess of the Moon also has a lot of regen stacked up. If you are anticipating having a one-on-one -on -one matchup, the Priestess of the Moon was, would most likely get it for some sort of damage item, or, which Big would help smoke coming in. Better. This uh, disruption should land on the Leshrac. I'm actually amazed that Boomski didn't lock it down there on Zizu. Like, he perfectly had the trajectory, but got fogged out at the very last second. Slightly delayed reflexes. Uh, might miss him out on that first blood. Yeah, I think he actually had the range for that, but regardless. So Krilly is going to go bottom. Um, as anticipated, they are going to offensive try lane just because it, it is the best thing to do for them here. And I think they're actually going to ward the chance creeps just to try to uh, even out the lane a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually is really good for them. Warding out the hard camp on the eastern side there, it, it negates a potential for safe farming for Nature's Prophet if he ends up hopping for the jungle, which the is unlikely is. given the current lane situation of one versus one down and bottom. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're also going to make sure that the Chen does not have those uh, better creeps to Holy Persuasion. Just makes it a little bit more RNG oriented where he only has a couple of good camps to work with and uh, if it, he gets a little bit unlucky that he's going to have a really rough time uh, trying to put pressure on this top lane which as you said is going for this try versus 2.5 setup which is going to be really good for them. I already talked about the combo of Disruption. It adds in uh, at least 2.5 extra seconds for the Illuminate to charge up and do a ton of damage here. And if you can stack up on top of that a big Marana arrow, that's a huge amount of disable. And, and although a hero like Lifestealer will be able to rage on out of those effects, a hero like Lashrak will just get completely shredded. So that's pretty much what we're going to be looking for there on the top lane. Already getting some good flanking Illuminates to go on through, hitting on Zizu and dishing out some damage there. He only has so many Tangos to work with, so that's going to be a limiting factor. But uh, what do you think about these other matchups, the one versus ones, the Magnus TA and the... Uh, Lone Druid up against the Nature's Prophet. If you notice, uh, Kojva, Kojva or whatever, is uh, the Magnus is actually getting levels of Empower, so every time he CSs at all, he's getting rid of a Refract Charge, which I mm -hmm. think is actually genius. And Mag in general, uh, once with the addition, you know, you can just Bottle Curl all day, so the matchup is actually a lot more even than you'd think, and you can just uh, spam Shockwave to CS. So Mag should actually do pretty decently I'm against... Going on in, up on the top lane, the Wildwing yeah. already doing the Tornado. They do defensively disrupt, but here comes that Splitter locking down a Boomski. They're going to put their damage back on Ares, and that Wildwing slow. The right clicks are there. Highlighting going to take the first blood. Looking for a little bit more, but just harassing them back for the moment. Oh, Splitter lands. They get it. The damage is there. Zizu using the slow of the Wildwing's Tornado. I didn't think he could land it. I thought that was over, but there goes the Splitter to prove me wrong. Zizu picking up a kill for himself as well. Yeah, just a scary moment. Um, well played by Mal's there. Mm -hmm. I think if uh, the Keeper of the Light gets out of position like that, it's going to be the hardest to defend him by far. 
Yeah, what do you think about that early tornado uh, as far as like a ganking tool? It's not something you usually see. You actually see a big disruption coming out on black. It's going to force a rage here. He's going to lose a big chunk of his HP, but he's got plenty of HP regen to work with. Goes Zizu going for another stun. Logging down two seconds. Right click go, but the arrow lands on Zizu. Damage going across. Air is no mana for Illuminate, but the right click should be enough with the Soul Cutter to lock him on down, and they turn it around for a kill on the board for themselves. Yeah, I think uh, Zizu should have started running back there a little bit earlier. There was actually no way for them to kill once... Um, but black was too low in HP to commit, so... And as expected, I'm pretty sure I actually don't have the kill death, or, um... The last hit deny chart, but I'm pretty sure Lone Druid should be absolutely stomping the bottom. Oh, absolutely. But that's... Yeah, that's actually not too unexpected. I'm pretty sure Malz is okay with that, as long as Paz... Um, when the lane starts pushing in and Chen gets one, uh, actually gets level 5 and gets two creeps, then they can play really aggressively on that top lane. He can just TP every single time and they'll get a tower out of it every time. So it's really important that, um... When 4FC has room like this, that they're taking advantage of it, and when they don't, they're playing really, really defensively. What they have to do is pretty obvious, so as long as they can execute, they should have a decent time at top. Because mm -hmm. as soon as um, Paz actually goes to gank, Lone Druid should be able to take a tower. That's the trade that you have to make. Yeah, very true. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, right now, the other lanes, the solo lanes, are doing extremely well for 4FC. Blomberg and Krilly are both topping out the charts on CS. Uh, Lone Druid is actually was almost doubling the Nature Prophet. He's caught up a little bit here. Pause, kind of swinging back, but it's still it's taking its toll, and they're definitely going to have a nice gold advantage going on into it, even though they did lose the first blood uh, up on the top lane. So that's kind of making it much more worth it that they have that much pressure coming out in the mid and bot. And yeah, like you said, that tower can drop so darn quickly. If Pause uh, if Pause gets entangled, he's going to lose. A third to half uh, of his health bar and uh, from there if he has to fall back and can't reinforce his tower uh, there are going to be a lot of issues with that bottom tier one uh, we do see more poke back and forth up on the top lane but it, it seems to be a little bit more bark than bite because uh, bite as they just kind of throw uh, a few auto attacks back and forth a lot of 600 range heroes so they can afford to do that yeah and mid's actually going to go pretty decently now that uh mag is level five and he can bottle crow just because he can spam the ta out of the lane she can't actually check runes very efficiently and he's actually not losing any sort of XP at all checking these runes as well mm -hmm. he's actually just like a tad behind and top is actually being zoned out black's finally starting to get some farm with the poles and this is exactly what uh, 4fc can't really afford for black to get any sort of farm attraction in this game Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, because he's, he's going to be pretty monstrous early on. He's not going to go for like a Midas build or anything like that. His farm has been a little bit too delayed for something like that. I actually do see Disruption coming on out, but I don't. I think it's just mostly to dissuade damage. Zizu does take a, about half a second arrow, but he'll come on out of that uh, swinging, and it looks like they're going to be perfectly fine here. But yeah, I think that every little bit of farm that Black can acquire is going to be a big, big deal long term. You can go for phase boots, go for maybe an armlet, or just kind of go for that race car build with a, a drum of endurance on top of the phase boots. I uh, just to stay on target there. Either way, he's going to be in a great position to dish out a lot of raw right-click damage, and if there's maybe like a Desolator later on from Pause to supplement that, it's going to really, really hurt 4FC. It's going to lock them, everybody but the Lone Druid, down pretty hard, because uh, Murano, she has great Agi scaling, but her, her HP is rather lackluster. I mean, only sitting at 550 right now, and it's only going to go I'll get a little bit better from there. So, uh, we'll have to see exactly how it plays out in team fights, but they really want uh, as much as possible. The entire objective of this tri lane situation is to uh, limit the farm coming out of black. Yeah, and bottom actually, we're gonna see uh, Paz get gone on it. Yeah, he's I gonna drown we'll... himself in. The right clicks won't be there. They don't have the vision. The bear actually will fall here as well, so that was gonna be a big chunk of damage loss for Krilly. He does have the tranquil boots, which he I think actually wasted there, uh, but uh, he'll be able to bring those back up in a minute. Either way, gets his bear back up, and this is a period of time where Nature's Prophet, he can TP scroll down to the tower, but there are going to be a few uh, right clicks onto it that is going to bring it down considerably, and that, that thing is going to fall. One day, <laughs> Curly is pretty much just put, uh, numbering its days here, and uh, soon enough that tower will be dropping down, but Paz has something to say about that and is just going to force him back for the time being. Yeah, Curly's actually doing a really good job. He's uh, taking advantage of the lane. He knows he has an advantage. He's playing really, really aggressively. He, if he actually gets consecutive roots, that should be Paz's life. So Paz has to be really careful, but I think he's just going to try to get the level 6 and set something up at top as soon as that happens. Because right now he's getting absolutely nothing accomplished at bottom. He's not really denying Lone Druid's farm at all, but, you know, I, that's pretty anticipated as that's not really the role of Lone Druid in a lane like this. Or uh, Nature's Nature Prophet, Prophet, that yeah. is. So, uh, one thing I gotta mention though is Murana's not really finding too much here. 16 and 11, uh, mostly focusing on the, the back and forth, but uh, Zaharasaurus, uh, the stand in here, is really just, uh, he is getting some farm here and there. He's gonna get his treads eventually for some extra just raw stats to work with, but 
in general, uh, I, I feel that they could be accomplishing a little bit more directly. They're kind of going back and forth. I mean, no, no offense to them, Mouse has been playing a really good game. Actually, there was a point where uh, the Chen uh, Pilate actually used a Holy Persuasion to deny a creep that was about to be last hit. So, I mean, just kind of doing those the cool little plays where they can uh, limit the farm of other people. That's going to be really, really what they're trying to do. But I just feel in this position here, Zaharas should be trying to put, make, get, at least get more farm than black, not break even, which is kind of what's happening right now. Yeah, it's just a little bit hard to break even in a lane where uh, both your, you've died and your supports died. And also, um, Nyx isn't actually too afraid of anything because he can just rage out of anything instantly. Mm -hmm. So he knows that. So all the Leshrac has to do is not get caught. Yeah, we see this fearlessness right off the bat. They do actually miss a stun, but they even follow up with the open wounds after the fact. They're like, screw it, we can go for it. The arrow does not work itself out. Defensive disruption delays the inevitable, but Boomski will fall here with the last right click uh, going to Chen. And so they're going to get a nice chunk of gold out of that. Move in. They already have their flying courier. Probably going to move in. It looks like towards a Basilius early on for Pilate, just to uh, continue to help out that push just a little bit. Yeah, it's just a pretty good item in general to get as well. Mm hmm. Great aura, great for tri this tri lane kind of circumstance. I mean, in general, they are perfectly fine. But yeah. black and you can also pick up. Uh, oh, down oh, the bottom. Pick up a Vlad's the entangle proc does connect onto pause, but he's just going to recall the bear away. And again, that's about a third, half of his HP. Really dueling it back and forth. The bear doesn't want to go under the tower, but uh, oh, well, Koikwa coming on in as well. Blomberg, this is going to be a two versus two down here. Koikwa looking, but he gets the root, gets the entangle, and there is going to be the stun from Zizio to finish him off. Now Blomberg in a rough spot, has that haste room for quite some time, but gets RP'd under the tower, will be dropped down in this short time frame because there's just so much right click there's a pulse nova but they actually can't finish it bomberg bottles away the lightning six hp is all he has left bomberg using the wand using the bottle and hasting on away just barely by the skin of his teeth up on top lane they were able to pick off on Ooh, that life still it didn't catch nothing. that there but Rana, uh not even using an arrow for this just going in for good star fall damage leaping right clicking but pause cleaning it up with a beautiful sprout giving him vision getting the right clicks but gets arrowed in the face coming on through she will fall next uh in line east keep of light will fall to pilati as well now they can go in for the push uh down on the tier one but man a lot of back and forth early on under attack yeah, and it's actually a pretty good trade though for uh, Mal's. They're doing pretty well. The Nature's Prophet, or not the Nature's Prophet, the uh, the Lone Druid's actually doing quite well, but he did die once, slowing down his farm considerably, and it's not a large enough lead for them to feel comfortable for the amount of deaths that they're giving up. Mm -hmm. And as far as that goes, um, the Magnus is actually farming quite well. He's picked up his mana boots. Um, he only has 100 gold, but he's actually doing a lot better than I thought he would overall. Mm -hmm. And as long as he can get any sort of decent RP off, then it should lead to kills at top as well. I, I assume that's where the next RP will be for. Yeah, most likely going to be trying to project that direction. And uh, Marana was able to find level 7, so she does have the ability to cast Moonlight Shadow at some stage, and I don't think they're really committing too much to detection. They do have one set of sentries up on the Chen, but it's not that big of a deal one way or another. Again, Black uses that infest just to just play a little cheeky. Uh, action where he knows he can regenerate a lot of life here, but we do see transitions coming up top. They want to keep this pressure rolling, but uh, yeah, like you were saying, uh, Black, or, or in general, um, Mouse Sports is getting a lot out of these kills, where they're falling behind on CS because Lone Druid and TA have just been relatively uncontested on their lanes. Uh, they're making up for it in the kills. We see 6-3 to three right now, and uh, it actually shows up on the gold graph. It's very much in their favor, about 1,000 gold in favor of mouse sports and the experience tells the same story so with that i really really think that uh mouse sports just want to keep those kind of good aggressive uh team fights going whenever they have the cooldowns to support it which of course that rp is back up and rolling yeah and actually with the type of heroes that 4fc have they don't actually have the best team fight whatsoever they really have individual shine like heroes that shine when cs and uh pushing so it's really important right now that they're getting like the lane domination and you know, they try to avoid straight up five on five fights, especially against heroes like uh, Lifesteal or Chen and uh, Magnus early. You want to try to avoid those fights and try to just pick up a CS advantage, especially since they yeah, offensive try lane like this and they put so much pressure on Nakes. So it's really, really important here that um, they're getting a lot of the lane. Yeah, Moonlight Shadow popped off, uh, forced out from the Marana. That is a pretty big cooldown, 160 seconds. They're just the Lifestealer dueling it out, back and forth with, with Marana. The leap didn't work out to uh, break the distance enough, and so she popped off early. But that does make it so that if they did land any more disables on her to follow up, she'd be in a really rough spot. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that Lone Druid has saved up 2,200 gold. Do you think that has to be an armlet? Um, I think that's the flavor of the weak build. Maybe he picks up... Um... 
There is actually a big team fight breaking out. We do see Lightning finishing off on the Ezalor here. They do get a disruption coming out onto Magnus, delaying that RP, but he's still going to get it out one way or another. Looking for Blomberg here. Uh, but yeah, casts it on her alone. Here comes Krilly, TP it on in. The Hand of God does come out. The burst damage going across. They want to focus down this Lone Druid. I think Ari finished off the TA, and it looks like they have enough people to do it. All the disable, all the damage, Krilly, all by himself. And that's going to be it. Some nice shadow point just blowing on out. And actually, long range shockwave, black, man and up. Down on the Marana, Erez might die again. But no, the infest comes out. They're just going to go for more and more push. We saw the tier 1 drop so darn quickly. And the tier 2 uh, will probably drop very, very quickly as well. Yeah, the issue with, um... The issue with uh, 4FC's lineup right now is that they have so little team fight that if the mag ults anybody, and he's always going to go for the TAA, they have enough spells that can drop her uh, refraction charges quick enough that they can just blow her up. So the amount of farm she has, and she's actually found quite a lit, is not being utilized whatsoever just because of the fact that she gets dropped in the beginning of the fight every time. Now, the Nature's Prophet just picked up approximately 13 minute Midas. That's definitely around the time he's going to be able to use it. Do you feel that's a little bit too late in the game to be emphasizing that kind of golden experience boost? Or do you feel like uh, no, no, there, no time is too late for a Midas? Um, I think certainly that there's a point in the game where it's not cost efficient anymore. But I feel for the situation that passes and where he's quite behind in CS, it's a good item that you can use. Because uh, you also don't have to use your ult to farm that way and take farm away from your carry. Sure. You can just use Midas. And on top of that, um, you know, you've got the early team fights here. You don't really need an item like mech off the bat. Your team's winning fights, so why not just be a little bit greedy? So just in case things go terribly, mm -hmm. you have some sort of um, farm advantage secured. Yeah, and there's a lot less responsibilities for him. You mentioned that mechanism, but it's almost actually done uh, for the Chen. He actually just needs the recipe to finish that on out, and uh, yeah, 900 gold, and then he'll have that himself. So Nature's Prophet can be a little bit greedy here, but he might pay be paying for it with the Panda Bear kind of flanking up from the side. It has quite a bit of mobility, but pause will just TP away. And even with the vision, there's not enough timing uh, for them to actually be able to bring him down. So good reflexive Radiant's action from pause and... Uh, yeah, that's based on the fact that they don't have any wards at all in this jungle, so just a uh, really, really good understanding of their positioning and a good reaction from him. Yep, and Black's just farming away. They realize at this point that without Shadow Demon getting level 6, they really have no way to pressure him. And even before that, without unless they devote like four heroes to killing him or they get a really lucky route while he tries to rage TP, as long as uh, Black can get the rage off, then he's pretty much invulnerable this game, so he feels perfectly comfortable farming up here, and that's kind of like the weakness of uh, 4FC's lineup. They don't really have anything to stop him pre-level 6 Shadow Demon. Mm -hmm. Or just hoping for lucky roots, yeah. but that's not really a reliable enough uh, reason for Krilly to be up there. Alright, so there is a Blink Magnus. He is walking underneath the Sentry Ward, but I don't think they actually... They did. They pinged it out. They had the full vision, so they know he's right here. They have 100%. They're going to try to go for a long-range arrow to catch him out. Uh, they, now he's getting right-clicked by the creep zone. He knows exactly what's going on there. So, the surprise factor gone, but he still has that Blink Dagger. He still has a lot of initiation potential, just uh, not at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and as long as... Uh, if you're going to watch the Magnus, all he's going to try to do is uh, ult the TA out, or the Queen of Pain, or any... T combination of two heroes because he knows that as long as he gets the uh, the RP off on any decent heroes then they're gonna win the fight yeah uh, by Queen of Pain did you mean uh, Marana or oh Marana or uh, the Templar Assassin sorry it's sure. early no problem so no problem. any sort of uh, any sort of uh, reverse polarity works for them as long as they get it off it should be a team fight win there you go. Yeah, I mean that's I mean that's their da primary source of damage there. The bear will be able to do a lot later, but right now, like I said, he's been saving up a ton of gold. Krilly hasn't picked up anything for this bear, so he might be a little swift on his feet with a little brown booties, but not really accomplishing too much. We do see Koi Koi coming on in, going directly for Ezlor, bringing him down quickly, but Blomber brings him with a huge melt strike, bringing down the last track immediately. Pause. TP's on away. No chance to stop him, but Koi Koi will be able to be brought down. Just force him down. Doesn't commit the RP wisely, so but yeah, there is pretty much. Much no hope for him in this position here. So good engagement from 4FC. They lose the support, but they pick up one of the core heroes along with that supportive lush rack. Yeah, but at the same time, Chen uh, manages to farm out his mech, and at the same time, Black has been farming his armlet up at top. He's been pretty much uncontested this entire time ever since the uh, 10 minute mark, and he's actually caught up pretty decently in CS, just being right behind the TA. Sure, but see TP is coming in on the mid lane. They're going to go aggressive here. Black wants to pop out that open wounds. Goes for Krilly, which I feel is a little bit too durable. Too much to chew, but they're actually going to go for it. Bring him down very, very swiftly with all those chain creeps that commit the time. But they lose Nature's Prof in the process. That's kind of what I was talking about there. They put so much time into just nomming on that very, very thick bear hide that they did lose a hero in turn, which in that position they didn't need to go for a one-for-one -one trade. Yeah. 
But that's a one for one trade that they're willing to take. That's the primary farm hero. And Black was there for the experience and everything. And on top of that, um, it was only a long lane Nature's Prophet that you traded for a short lane carry. So um, uh, we already mentioned the fact that Maus has quite a bit of utility uh, build up in their supportive heroes. Do you feel it's right for Nature's Prophet to go for right click damage here? He's looking for the Shadow Blade to follow up his Midas. Uh, is that something that you would uh, prefer in this situation? Yeah, it's a really good split pushing mobility item. It's really good initiating. Um, you can pretty much one shot supports with it. You uh, just ult in preemptively if it does any sort of damage, then you just right click once or twice, and you're in a really good position. And if I were Maus here, actually, I would take that last T1 tower bottom. Um, and then just go straight for Roshan, because I don't think that 4FC can contest an open ground against a Magnus Ultimate. Yeah, that's very, very true. In fact, he's been saving that for quite some time. Might be looking to use it uh, down on Krilly on the bottom lane, but we'll have to see. He does actually pincer him in, gets a little bit of vision. Now he is completely locked in place. No chance at all for him. The Splitter does come out, and they're just going to be able to finish him off. So Krilly having a really rough time. I think he just resummoned his bear. No, he's got 10 seconds left on the, the cooldown there. He actually didn't have his bear at all in that situation. Actually, a little bit uh, good for him. Like, if this had happened 20 seconds later, he might have just, re you know, as you normally would, summon your bear to get it on cooldown, and then suddenly lost it a second time in a row, which would be very, very punishing for him. Yep, yep. And it looks like they're feeling pretty comfortable continuing to go. Magnus actually TP's back mid, see if he can get anything started, but... Looks like uh, Malz is actually just going to take this, and with that, they should actually Roshan and try to get that last T2 tower mid if I were them. Yeah, they got this, easily got this tier 2 down on bottom, and they're getting so much map control from this. Luckily, 4FC is really on top of wards. This placement here, actually, a lot of aggression on mid. They do commit that reverse polarity, lock them in place, and bring both of them down. TA, Shadow Demon, both overstayed their welcome just a little bit. And with the easy, convenient global teleport of pause, and then a single, just 3 second delay teleport from one of the allies, Quickwo was able to do a lot with that blink. RP that was ranked 2 from being level 11, so really, really good initiation from them and getting more kills on the board, 15 to 6, is there anything 4FC can do to pull it back right now? Yeah, it's uh, not as if they're in dire straits right now. Having a hero like Lone Druid, he does quite well in the late game, and I mean, <laughs> technically it's a 12 stacked bear, right? Yeah. You can get 12 potential items on him, um, they always have the Keeper of the Light to fall back on to just spam his ultimate all day. Priest of the Moon is actually picking up a defusal pretty soon, so things aren't completely out of the question for them to win. They just really need to get a team fight off where um, they can utilize the Disrupt and the Shadow Demon ult properly. Because right now they've been doing the smart thing by not engaging in straight up 5 on 5 fights, but that's what Maus is looking for. And every time uh, 4FC goes on anybody, because all the towers are up except top, um, they're able to counter TP in really aggressively. Mm -hmm. And as long as they lead with the Magnus TPing in first, then no matter what, they're going to catch somebody out. And that's kind of the strength of the lineup right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. So, they're not actually committing directly to this Roche. Is there something that they're afraid of since they do have the Reverse Polarity on cooldown? I just think it's because there's some farm out on the map. Um, mm -hmm. Reverse Polarity is going to be up in a second too. If you notice... Um, Kajkva actually did the really smart thing here by smoking, so he doesn't actually get hit by the Shadow Demon Poison, and doesn't get his Blink Dagger disabled, and I think he's just going to wait on the outskirts. There is some farm out on the map, so Pass is going to go top, and obviously they don't really need him, and he can come in at the end as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not really imperative for them to do it right now, but they are going to finish it up here. Yeah. And also using that smoke to see it as a little bit of a sensory type thing where they just say, okay, well, they're within 900 units. We know when to go. Great. Oh my gosh, going for a blink skewer. Quick, well, trying to go in and pick up Blomberg once more. Not finding the opportunity, but uh, just a little bit, just a bit of distraction tools. They now feel extremely confident about this Roche. It's a completely different mentality and uh, movements than what we were seeing maybe even 15 seconds ago. They changed their uh, opinion 100% based on that RP. And uh, yeah, they found opportunity to farm a little bit on the lane, farm up the Roshan, and get that Aegis on the life cycle. He wasn't survivable enough. He's got Armlet, he's got Infest, he's got an Aegis the Immortal, and uh, he did go for that movement speed build. The drums and phase are up. Now, that does mean they do have two drums of endurance, one on the Magnus, one on the Nakes, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of potential for them to be mobile, active, and engaging on their terms. Yeah, and actually, um, I actually really like the speed build that's popularized by players like. Uh, FNC and uh, YYF, it just makes it so that the space that um, you need to keep away from Nakes is so large, and it's really easy for him to just roll in and pick off a support really easily with just one open wounds and a rage, and especially with the lineup like 4FC has, like they, it's a little difficult for them to stop him from just running in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that's, I mean, 100%, I have to commit the Demonic Purge to him every single fight, and although that helps quite a bit, with all these great stuns, the Zizu landing amazing splitters, the Koikwa with those powerful RPs, it's really, really setting it up where it, it it's not that big of a deal. Because he has the Drummond phase, he'll be fast enough to get into the position he wants, and from there, committing a lot. We do see on top lane, they do force out a fortification uh, with the Lone Druid, putting out some pressure with the bear, but popping that battle cry, using that refraction, they're actually going to chew into this extremely quickly, going for a one-for-one -one trade on towers, but the fortification comes out from 4FC, so advantage right now uh, for 4FC in this kind of a exchange, but uh, very, very short-lived as Miles answer back with their own tier 2 kill. And uh, I, I don't feel that right now 4FC is in a position where they can just commit to a tier t a 3. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, playing against a hero like Keeper of the Light is going to be difficult. They're actually either going to need to get a pipe or about like a 20k gold advantage. I think that's what um, Brax said once in an interview. You either need one of those two. You either need pipe mech or a 20k gold advantage. Actually, I think he said all three just because of the uh, advent of buybacks. Everyone just saves money, you mm -hmm. know, sure. so they can fight twice. Oh, they went on top. He actually used RP too. He got nothing out of it. Oh wow, I didn't even catch that. Um, who were they going on? Uh, I believe they were going on the Priestess of the Moon, and she actually just TP'd, and he was just a second late. No, it wasn't the Queen. Uh, Priestess of the Moon, it was actually Krilly. Oh, sorry. yeah, Krilly, so. Nevertheless, ouch, that is definitely, obviously, they were hoping to get more out of that, wasting a couple of cooldowns there. That's obviously not really what they were, had intended going there, and it does lose them a little bit of a foothold in uh, what their current situation is. Uh, again, good warding coming out from the Radiant. They're actually warding up their own uh, jungle directly, netting the kill on Pylidi. It's going to be a long one. It's going to be a little bit of a wild goose chase, but with the Suffused of the Lock in place, I'm 100% certain they should be able to bring him down. Cause does get a beautiful Sprout off, though. They don't have any tree cutters. They don't have a leap, and completely negating the sentiment, Pylidi gets completely bailed out by Paws and a beautiful Sprout coming out. Yeah, and 4FC actually doing a really smart thing here, just uh, trying to clear out their jungle, get as much farm as, out as they can where they know people are. Um, I noticed Krilly's actually going to uh, pick up a Radiance, which mm -hmm. is a little bit old school, but I agree with in a situation like here, where they're having a difficult time uh, keeping Mouse from pushing, the Radiance Bear, er, keeps all the lanes pushed out really easily, and on top of that, uh, it just increases his farm. So I think 4FC realizes right now, as a team fight team, they're going to get stomped. So I think that they realize they, they have to take it a bit later than this. So mm -hmm. utilizing the uh, Keeper of the Light Blast, the Radiance Burn, and the farming potential that it gives, I think that they're hoping to secure the late game. Yeah. Yeah, I think it took him a little bit longer than he would have preferred to get pick up that Radiance, but nevertheless, he does have it. And one other thing that I really like about it is that in a team fight, you're generally going to throw your bear into the thick of things, just ju jumping on into it. Uh, his first life, you're generally a lot more careless about. Uh, not an extent that he's wor worthless, but just that you have another one uh, at your disposal. But uh, pretty much what that means is if the bear is in an aggressive position in the middle of things, uh, the Magnus' blink is going to be on cooldown. And Koiko is going to have to commit a skewer just to get an RP off, and it's not going to be nearly as optimal as the ones we've been seeing out prior to this point. So I really, really love it. Not only as a farm uh, thing, not only as a split push thing, but now as putting pressure out on uh, Koikwa and making sure that he can't do things like this. But he does jump in. He does get the blink and the RP. Missing up with the Sprout a little bit and Split Earth. That skewer was not coordinated with the allies, but it does not matter in the end. It's all a moot point because in the end, they still get that kill. Yeah, and Krilly's actually a hero that's really important for them to keep off the map. If they want to keep the late game going, they need him alive and constantly, consistently farming. But now it's a uh, now it's a different story as it creates a lot of space for a mouse to do whatever they want. As it's a four on five fight that they can't really afford to take for a four FC. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so movement uh, between Quirkwa and Black, they're gonna go in and just go for that infest inside the Magnus. Even if he can't RP, he's still a very great threat with that burst magic damage to come on out. And Mag actually picks up a gem just to uh, keep all vision off, so they don't know where they are. Four FC is gonna have to get really, really creative with their uh, wards here, and actually negates the Priestess of the Moon ult as well. Yeah, that's actually a really, really good movement from them. That's exactly what they need to accomplish, honestly. This gem is pretty much what they needed to make sure that they could 100% secure a fight, because previously they, they had good sentries, they did a lot of that, but this, that makes sure that the supports have to commit a ton. Oh, over time, you add in so much cost 
when you consider how much you really, really put into sentries over and over. Every single team fight dropping one down just to not have to worry about that uh, Moonlight Shadow. We do see him power coming out in the life who actually picked up a Sanjin Yasha. We were talking about movement speed, and this is actually one of the uh, best movement speed items in the game. Uh, but beyond that, I don't really feel like it's a late game item. With this Aegis of the Immortal, until he picks up Boots of Travel, he's effectively 6 slotted. He did just lose the Aegis due to its duration timeout, but... Uh, uh, what do you think about the Sanjin and Yasha pickup, especially at this stage in the game? I know this is actually like YYF's identical build. This is exactly what he does, uh, YYF from IG. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a pretty neat item. It, if you get any sort of slow off, it equates to a kill. It makes uh, a hero like Lifesteal, you absolutely need to lock him down for a really long time. And 4FC just doesn't have the disables to handle him. Like after the Demonic Purge goes off, what else? I guess they can defusal him, but if they commit that much to it, then... There's still a lot of damage on uh, Mao's side. Pass is actually going to pick up a sheep stick here just in a second too. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a big factor going on in the team fights there. If he can get that out, uh, there's no BKB uh, type heroes on uh, 4FC. I mean, Templar Assassin would love to pick up one, but right now he's going for that Desolator and really just doesn't have the build up for it. So uh, there aren't going to be any BKB carriers, and that's something that can be easily exploited by this size device. I mean, 3.5 seconds is an eternity in a Dota team fight, and I really, really think that that Scythe will be making sure that if they weren't already destroying the fights, this is going to really set it up. They don't have to perfectly RP the TA and the Lone Druid. Now they can just pick off one of them and uh, following on through the Nature's Prophet can disable the other and I think they can just deliver their damage in that time frame and uh, really accomplish whatever they want from there. Yeah, but as the, lane, the game goes on, uh, 4FC does get a bit more opportunities to extend the game and potentially win a team fight. It's really, really difficult for uh, Mouse to straight up push in into the Keeper of the Light. I know they, they continue to try, but it's going to be pretty fruitless for quite some time. Because uh, what stops a push is the creep wave, right? If you lose your creep wave, it's really difficult for you just to commit bodies to attack. Kelly's in a bad spot. On Profit right on top of him. There's that Infest to come on out. No, actually going to delay it here. The root comes through. They're trying to counter initiate. On the pause, the arrow comes out, and they're going to get black too. He's going to go for the Rage TP, but he gets entangled. He does get it interrupted, and he's going to get right clicked on down, feasting away on the bear. This not a lot of damage that way, but the Meld Strikes, the Desolator, it's too much for them, and they lose two. They the were so overconfident in that position there. They had no vision at all. They I'm jumped here. in, and Bear's just sitting on top of it. Lundra, it's like, come at us. We're ready for it. And uh, they were able to counter gank extremely effectively. Ready with Dust, ready with the arrow. Perfect counter initiation coming out of 4 FC. Yep, and Magnus actually picks up a Shadow Blade. Um, I'm a little concerned about that pickup as they already have one. Yeah. And I think they just gave up the gem as well, so picking up an eye up like no, that... No, the Magnus stones the gem. Oh, they destroyed it? Oh, wait, no, 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 no. It was on the Nature's Trophy, I'm so sorry. But, still a scary item to get. But I don't think, um... 4FC actually knows that he has the uh, the Shadow Blade whatsoever. Yeah. Now, if the one thing I gotta comment on is how fast those friggin' towers fall. I mean, you have a Hyperstone and a Radiance on the bear with a Demolish passive, making sure you do 140% damage to buildings. And then on top of that, you have the Desolator reducing its armor by 6. That bear just completely chews down on it. He's pretty much like a one animal demolition crew. And with that, it, Tier 2s fall really, really quickly. I mean, they had all the time in the world. Uh, but just using it very effectively here is pretty much if there's ever a fight lost by mouse, we haven't seen that yet, but if there is a 5v5 lost by mouse, that's going to be racks easily because of how rapidly they can push. Yeah, and it's actually really imperative that uh, mouse starts getting things done with the next Aegis. They still neglect to get a pipe, so it's going to be difficult for them to push in, but at this point, the longer the game goes, uh, it's a lot worse for them. They actually need to start committing things to happening once the uh, Aegis comes out. Last time they were really inefficient with it, but I think this time it's going to de uh, actually determine the game for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a little bit of attempted at de-warding coming out of Magnus, Blink, Skewer, yada yada. With that Gemetry site, he's just like, I can pretty much control the map as best as possible, and that seems to be what's happening. I mean, we look at the Radiant Wards, they have a sentry in their own jungle, and that's about it. Their Radiant Vision has been penned in to this tiny sliver of space. I mean, even the Nature's Prophet push is only just now being found out. So, uh, it's really in this kind of position, they don't really have uh, too much understanding, and even going out in this position here is rather risky for them, as they could easily be flanked on up, but they need to be branching out, because this Roche is going to be dropping quickly, and like you said, that Aegis is imperative uh, for Mal's to really, really uh, put the hurt on 4FC in this next 10-minute segment. Yeah, it's really imperative that uh, Mal's actually get something done uh, sooner rather than later. Pas still does have a sheep stick, it wasn't properly utilized last time. Priestess of the Moon is actually picking up quite a bit of farm now too. 
it's gonna be difficult for them to deal with her. They're actually gonna maybe have to commit the uh, the sheep on her next time, as her damage actually isn't like nothing. She actually does quite a bit, and Templar Assassin with that uh, Desolator actually puts out a lot of pure damage. Yeah, one hundred percent. That those pure those nukes on that uh, seven second cooldown on the melt strikes are insane. Uh, her static damage is really good, but uh, comparatively speaking, the one thing Marana has that she doesn't is range. Uh, because uh, the Templar Assassin, she has a Blink Dagger, she can get close at one point, uh, but she doesn't want to get in over her head, so she might be a little uh, semi-cautious with that Blink, and uh, from there, Marana will be the one that's delivering uh, almost as much right-click damage, just based on the fact that she has the range to keep it on the targets that she wants to focus, and so that's going to be a big difference between the two, because uh, there's not really any hard disables for 4FC. Uh, they have great soft disables, they have the, the Blinding Light, they can entangle, root somebody down, uh, they even have stuff like the Shadow Demons, Demonic Purge, and Disruption. Those are those, those are all really solid, but as far as lo hard lockdown, they're not going to really find too much. We do see the bear getting picked off here. It's going to force out a resummon from that lone druid, and uh, yeah, really has to be a little bit more cautious with this one for the next 120 seconds. Yep, Krilly's actually uh, got a decent amount of farm. He does quite a bit of damage. He does go down kind of quickly, though, to a hero like Life Stealer, who just eats away at him, and Pass actually going to pick up the next uh, item for him. He's got 2,800 gold, and it's important that the next item that he picks up, actually, uh, I think he should go for a DPS item now. Uh, what would you have in mind, like a Desolator, or...? Um... Uh, let's see... I mean, an Echo Book 3 would work, too. Yeah. Um, he could pick up something like that. Picking up an item like uh, Mjolnir actually does quite well too. Crit would work as well. Any one of those combination of heroes. And actually, they're going to go on up top. Yeah, up top, they have pretty much every opportunity in the world. The Scythe comes out first, the RP on both of them, and there's pretty much no hope at all. Everybody is here. The whole party has been brought. And uh, yeah, they just slam it on down. All four individuals, all five individuals jumping on in. Really, really good usage of their abilities and their uh, the fact that there's not too much vision for 4FC. Use the smoke, got uh, to close the distance, and from here, Blomberg is caught all by himself. Has to, is gonna have to TP back after a little bit of split push on the mid, and uh, this tier three is definitely gonna be pressured within this next 30 second frame. The big thing I was talking about is Krilly's bear. 40 seconds, so even when he comes up, he's still gonna have to wait about 10 seconds before he gets that resummon off. And uh, that's gonna be that 10 second frame where they can push very hardcore on this tower. Starting off with an infest though, I'm not sure how I feel about that. They actually tele teleport on in with the Shadow Blade, trying to find one more individual. They get the sheep, they get the right clicks from the Shadow Blade, and they bird him down. Now moving on in, they don't have a support to worry about. They're going in on Ares, he can go for the Blinding Light, but it won't do anything to the Rage. The last hit comes up from Pi Lighty and that Test of Faith, and they will be able to bring down this tower, and most likely the Rax. Again, Bear not up for another 10 seconds, and two supports down. They buy back with the Keeper Light, uh, but the racks have already fallen. All they can try to do to prevent now is a rotation on the mid. They can try to prevent the tier 3 on the mid lane from falling, and I think they might be able to do that, uh, but it's all about that initiation, all about the uh, positioning that everybody's in here, and the Bear just running on through, uh, doing a bit of damage across, but uh, Marana actually trying to lock down that arrow onto Black. Either way, a lot of damage going across. Black does eat and illuminate in the face, trying to go for that skewer. Boikwa doesn't quite uh, make it work. They take the tower, they run for the hills, and uh, I think they will be able to get out of here without too many casualties. Yeah, and actually, I think uh, oh, they Mal's go right on in. The snare, the sheep, they go and try to bring down the Marana. Defensive disruption, nice play there, but Black still has the Aegis to work with. He's kind of fearless with his current uh, disposition. Blomberg bursting down hard on the last track, though. Aegis goes on the ground for a little bit. Black will pop back up, but they already lost their, their uh, token. They've lost the last track, and they should be falling back from here. Yeah, they do still have the Magnus Salt, so if 4FC decides to overcommit to this, that's uh, something that they have to slightly worry about, but the mid tower actually does go down, meaning that they can go high ground the next Aegis. If oh, there goes. RP on Blomberg solo. Really, really committing to this TA here. Uh, she does have buyback. We'll pop it off immediately, and uh, I guess they just forced out a ton of cash out of that assassin. Yeah, and actually, she really needed that. Um, it, it was necessary for her to buy back, because in a 4 on 4 situation, they'll trade the last track for the TA. But forced to buy back here, not going to get another item for quite some time. Um, she actually just finished her um, the Chrysalis, so that's quite a bit of damage coming out. But now it's taking a commanding lead. I think if they take another set of racks, it's going to be too difficult for uh, 4FC to defend past this. And Black's actually going to get a heart. Oh wow, heart of Tarask in full. That's really, really good for him. 
He lost the Aegis, so he has that extra item slot to work with, and he's really putting his money to work here. He won't have buyback for a little while, but man, does he have plenty of HP to work with here. With the armlet up, it's 3,600, and uh, he can keep that up indefinitely now because of the hard to trash passive regeneration. So always having armlet on always is helpful there, and of course the infest gives him a nice burst of health on top of that. So uh, yeah, plenty of right-click damage. Uh, not the best in attack speed, really. He just has some from the drum, armlet, and the uh, Yasha portion of Sanjin Yasha. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, he's going to be swinging away, and he's going to be able to uh, dish out a lot of damage and tank up a ton. Yeah, and actually, Pass has 3,700 gold. He's got the Demon Edge. I'm not actually entirely too sure what he's going. I'm kind of hoping that he's going for, uh, well, we're ahead, I'll get a Rapier. Mm. That'd, that'd be fun. That would be hilarious, actually. But I, I think that that... Uh, that would be a little bit. I mean, they're like you said, they're currently ahead, and I don't think they want to that to change very, very rapidly. And I feel a loss of divine rapier could do just that, especially a good five second Marana arrow shuts him down 100. percent So oh, I would yeah, say more likely in MKB to counteract the blinding light, uh, but a Daedalus is also an okay uh, item to work with there. Yeah, it'd actually be absolutely insane for them to get an item like that, but it would certainly make things interesting. I know Korok would do it because he's a showman, but. Sure, sure. That, that's the mentality, though. That's the big thing, is uh, really just how deep do you want to go, and uh, yeah, you can have some, you can get a little bit of fandom with it, but uh, on top of that, you could be throwing away a game, and it looks like it's just going to be the day, day Dallas here. Yeah, he's actually just going to play it safe, boo, but a lot of farm going on him. I think he's actually going to wait until he has buyback as well, just because um, having a hero like Profit with the buyback is so key, just because he can instantly come back into the team fight. Oh, they're going to go on top, actually. I think Krilly's going to get caught out here. Yep, is got the infested nakes right on side. The bomb will be ticking away, going for that Shadow Blade initiation here. And Krilly, yeah, caught out in a bad spot here. The site to start off. And uh, here it comes. Here's the nakes doing that. They sprout away, making sure that he can't get too close, but they don't have anything to bash him up with. And Krilly just walks away. No hard lockdown after that scythe was already expended. And, uh, yeah, with that, Krilly just keeping out of a bad position here. The bear even playing around with the radiance, but it looks like it will fall. The right clicks, so you cannot recall it. And uh, from there, he's going to have to resummon once again. Yeah, no, shit, that was a really bad spot by uh, Mal. They wasted a lot of time during the, the hex actually doing nothing. And going in RP on Blomberg solo. Get that skewer, but interrupted a little bit by that blinding light. Defensive disruption comes out. Zizu gets hit by a four second arrow. Big damage going across Blomberg. Will be able to burst pretty hard, but trapped in. Locked in the pit. Locked in the zoo with the Chen Creeps here. Now the hand of God comes out. They test the faith back. The last track keeping him safe. Krilly is up in the action though. Gets the Entangle Rock on Pylite, trying to burst him down. And without an RP, there's nothing to peel. There's nothing to keep him off. And Pylite will fall along with that. Zahar is taking a ton of damage. Doesn't have that leap for a few more seconds. Just needs to maybe defusal the Magnus. I don't even know. Gets hit by the Shockwave. Gets hit by the next right click to finish him off. On the western end, there was the pickoff. Krilly did put some damage in and no, nope, actually didn't get anybody else for his trouble. But Koikwa gets dusted up. Shadow Blade won't help him here and he does get brought down. But now coming on in, Black and Paws dishing out a ton of damage. Gem on the ground uh, will be, I'm not even sure, destroyed most likely. And from there, Krilly does get brought down. So the bear, I believe, picked it up, uh, but I'm not 100%. Yeah, it did actually. And he was trying to hide it with his death. Really smart plan, but he actually doesn't see it. Oh god, does he? Oh, okay. The Chen's actually gonna, just going to go for it because he has a free slot, but mm -hmm. um, that was actually, it looked like a really good fight for 4FC. They got the arrow off. Um, Mag RP actually got stopped by the disruption on the TA, but just a little too much damage, and I think that Black's actually way too hard for them to deal with at this point. 2,500 gold, he's not going to get any weaker, and the heart makes it so that they can't focus him, but they can't leave him alone either. So mm -hmm. just... They're in the worst possible situation right now. Pons should be picked off here. They do get the Demonic Purge. They burst him down. TA is inside that set of trees, and they're in a good spot. Their airs will be dropped as well. Black just right-clicking away. No problem at all. Uh, won't be affected by any of the incidental damage going across, and it looks like they'll be able to... Oh, wow, they got the, the kill on the Shadow Demon of just a Wrath of Nature during that Ghost Scepter, and that is going to be the GG call. Uh, they definitely have earned it throughout this entire match. It's been a, a long while coming, but finally we do see here uh, this huge advantage, this 25k gold, uh, and uh, even more so in the experience department, has really, really added itself up so that they just overwhelm the opposition, and now having taken the mid racks, about to finish off, yeah, the bottom is down as well. They're going to be pushing in for the win here, and that's going to be it for this one. So this best of three series, we're going to see what happens between these guys here, four friends and Krilly versus Mouse Sports in game two, but uh, what do you think about this first one? Is there anything that 4FC could have done to pull themselves out of this, other than just uh, turning it out further? I don't actually think they play too badly. I think Mal's, uh is just a really good team. I think they're uh, a little bit 
better than uh, 4FC is in general. So 4FC actually put up a pretty good showing, but in terms of the picks, they relied a lot on the offensive tri lane to accomplish more than it did. Um, the Chen actually rotated really well. The Magnus actually made TA kind of a useless pick. If you notice, every time the RP went off, for the most part, it was just on her. So it made it so that uh, TA here, that's kind of like a glass cannon, actually wasn't able to put out any sort of damage. So maybe um, a different sort of picks would work for them, as Malz utilizes that we're going to team fight a lot using our carry as well um, kind of fight style. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I mean, that's exactly how they kind of played it out, and it, it worked out very, very nice. I love the movement for Miles in general. I, I think that they were able to put the aggression out so that if they ever tried to go for, okay, I'm going to farm out past, uh, around near the river or something like that, the flanks were there. The Nature's Prophet global presence was certainly felt in this uh, match here. And uh, with that, on top of that, the life stealer just kept on farming away. So he actually played a little bit of a half supportive life stealer. His ending KDA was 1, 2, and 14, seriously. But, uh, you know, just dishing out the right click damage. The kills were there. I mean, they had the, the kill advantage of 26 to 12. So although they weren't re necessarily going in his uh, direction, nevertheless, the kills were on the board. And that's kind of what counted long term. So, you know, carry Chen, 7, 1, and 7. Supportive life stealer, 1, 2, and 14. Adds up nicely. But uh, either way, really, really cool game. And Mouse Sports just taking it away very very solid from them and we're going to go on to game two to check out uh what 4fc has to answer back with so thank you guys so much for tuning in and uh this has been blaze and blitz